Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to welcome this morning the Honorable Finance Minister of India, Arun Chaitley, and we all remember. Please. The theme of this meeting is delivering growth in the next context, and we will uh, look at some of the specific challenges of India uh, in very intensive interactive sessions later this morning and this afternoon, but we have the great opportunity to create a kind of framework for our discussions together with the Minister of Finance. Now, Minister, last year when we met, you presented your reform plans. When you look back, are you happy about what happens this year? What lessons did you learn from what you achieved and what you may have not achieved during the last 12 months? Well, I have a reasonable sense of satisfaction. A reasonable sense of satisfaction because uh, over the last uh, 17 odd months, uh, I think there are a few present experiences. The confidence uh, of both uh, domestic investors and international investors in Indian economy has been restored. This has happened during a time when the world is passing through very challenging moments. We have set a direction uh, for the Indian economy consistently with every measure we are moving in that direction and we are not allowing uh, any policy change which is of a contrarian direction. I think India has become highly aspirational. Unlike what happened, um, let's say, 21, 24 years ago, where uh, those who wanted to obstruct change and reform were in very large numbers also, also within the ruling dispensation. I think India has evolved out of that kind of situation. Within the government, there is an absolute uh, consensus and unanimity about the direction to be followed. The popular constituency which supports change, reform and growth now has become much bigger than the one which resists it. I think this is on the more positive stance. Uh, I am not going into macroeconomic data which everybody is aware of. On a more challenging uh, side, well, India is a very, very highly functional democracy and uh, a federal polity. Uh, I think the response of the states has been extremely positive. Most states have been competing with each other in order to march forward. That, that's another high point that I've seen. Uh, the difficulties are, uh, when I said uh, uh, a very vibrant democracy, that you will have people for political reasons taking a political position to obstruct reforms. Now, within the general mass of uh, public opinion, the support for that is very little. But temporarily, they may be able to halt or stop certain measures. But I think once a direction is set, uh, uh, the movement for that change will go on. And I must say, having taken a large number of steps already in that direction, I can at least uh, look down the tunnel over the next one or two years. I think I'll still have my hands full about the direction to be followed. Minister, I think the vision is very clear and it's felt by everybody here. So it's a new spirit in India. Um, it's also, of course, reflected in the World Economic Forum's um, competitiveness report. I never have seen such a jump in a country in a positive way. Um, but um, 
when I listen to the, to the people here and I would, uh, to, to our members here, there are two issues which come up again and again. Uh, it's the goods and services tax and of course the land acquisition bill which have been um, uh, promised and uh, even a date has originally been set. Um, what would be your a message to the business community which is so eagerly um, expecting this reform? Well, I'll, 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 uh, when I uh, uh, talk about the goods and services tax, I'll take that opportunity to let you know generally about uh, the direction of the taxation reform mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. And I'll come to the GST uh, as a part of that. You see, I had inherited uh, uh, a legacy where the taxation policy of India and our processes had become uh, literally a drab on the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. Now, when I started off, uh, it was a retrospective tax. It was... Uh, 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 some exaggerated demands uh, which were uh, uh, really frightening uh, both international and domestic investors and I had a table full of those uh, problems and these are not easy problems to be resolved particularly if assessment orders have been passed uh, you have no executive power to set them aside they can only be set aside uh, either by a change in law or they can be set aside by uh, a judicial or a quasi-judicial order now, consistently, we worked in a direction to remove uh, that fear of a highly adversarial and an oppressive tax structure. Now, I must say with a sense of satisfaction that a very large number of those issues uh, are now behind us. Mm -hmm. Systematically, one by one, we've been resolving each one of them. That uh, fear of the retrospective taxation is gone. Two or three of those problems uh, still remain. And they remain really because of legal reasons. And I have publicly announced uh, that uh, we are looking for uh, processes uh, by which we can resolve some of those issues also. Even with regard to domestic taxation, I think we are making now the processes much simpler. Uh, uh, people file returns online. People get refunds online. Uh, there is hardly an interaction between the uh, interpersonal interaction, even now queries uh, since last week will only be addressed online and responses will be taken online and orders will be passed. Uh, uh, so it's becoming far more reasonable. Uh, uh, of course, there will be aberrations which we'll try and address. Uh, I've also announced the roadmap for direct taxation uh, uh, to bring it, the corporate tax down to uh, uh, 25% while phasing out uh, some of those exemptions and I think I'm going to publicly uh, put in the public domain over the next few days uh, 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 some of those exemptions which we intend to phase out in the first uh, round. The first tranche of reduction of the corporate tax I hope to do it in very near future uh, 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 whenever the new finance bill comes up. Now having said this the indirect taxation reform which is the G goods and services tax uh, has been promised by us. Now we made considerable headway. The parliamentary standing committee had recommended it. The lower house by two-third majority has passed it. Mm -hmm. Almost all state governments are on board. And I must say even the state governments of the Congress party had actively supported it. The chairman of the empowered committee is a finance minister belonging to the Kerala government itself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we, we continued the practice of uh, giving the chairmanship to the, a member of the largest opposition in order to build uh, a consensus. And uh, it came up in the upper house. The standing, the select committee of the upper house had also approved it. And therefore, I must say that a national consensus has been built. The trading community in India, the industry, the business, the popular opinion all supports this. Almost everybody has editorially backed it. At this stage, uh, I say this with a sense of uh, regret, that uh, there was a policy somersault as far as the Congress party is concerned. And regrettably, it was led by the people who had moved the, the GST bill itself. And this policy somersault was not for any policy reasons, it was for political reasons, because uh, the policy seemed to be obstruct. 
I have been discussing with a large number of members of the Congress party itself. And uh, even in the last session with all others supporting us, we had the numbers in the upper house. And therefore, <coughs> with numbers in the upper house, we could have passed it, so the strategy changed, you don't allow the house to function. Now, of course, these are uh, problems that we, challenges we have in Indian democracy, but this can't go on indefinitely. As and when it is put to vote, it certainly would be approved, because I am quite confident we have the numbers on our side. In any case, within months from now, the numbers in the upper house are going to tilt a lot more. And therefore, uh, 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 that, that makes it far easier for us. Am I willing to discuss this with the Congress party? I've repeatedly said I am. I've been so far discussing it with their leaders and I can't find any uh, 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 at least uh, conceptual opposition to it. Uh, I'll again once again speak to them and try to make them see reason. I think GST is only a question of time. Uh, uh, it's only a question of time. They can delay it by obstruction, but since obstructions don't continue indefinitely, uh, I think uh, as and when it's put to vote, uh, I see GST becoming a reality. I have both the supporting legislations that we need to implement GST in readiness. I also have uh, the IT backbone necessary for it absolutely in readiness. So the moment the upper house passes it, we can get 50% of the states to ratify it at the earliest and uh, be in a position to put it into motion. The second factor you mentioned about the land bill. You see, availability of land is, 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 a, is a prerequisite uh, as far as any growth is concerned. Uh, urbanization, suburbanization will be a reality. Infrastructure, land is required for rural development, land is required for rural irrigation, electrification, housing schemes, land is required for housing for uh, the underprivileged, land is required. And if you don't make land available, uh, I think the, the, the growth process itself comes to an end. Now, obviously, the persons who either sell land or land is taken from somebody must be paid and must be more than adequately compensated. There is no difficulty. Now, again here, the, it was the Congress chief ministers amongst others who had suggested that we needed the changes. So the government in good faith accepted their advice and went ahead on a particular course of action. Once we brought it to parliament, they changed their strategy and said, no, we will oppose it. We again called the chief ministers who said it's a concurrent list subject where both the center and the states have a parallel jurisdiction. So we know the requirements of our state. We'll bring about amendments which are needed in the state, provided the center agrees to give its assent to it. We said we'll give assent to whichever state wants it. So there is a change of strategy that let the states bring about any change if they think it is necessary. And the states have now set that process into motion. The first state has already sent its proposals to the center. We've accepted it and they've notified it. And therefore, I, I'm sure when the other states come up as and when, and this will only happen in those states which need the land. And ultimately, I think uh, uh, this issue by this, meanwhile, the ordinance has lapsed, but the bill remains before the select committee. There are some changes on which uh, uh, a consensus, some minor changes on which a consensus is possible. So we'll try and see if in the coming session that consensus can be worked out. I think it's very reassuring to see the clear vision behind now. And, and when I look at uh, the discussions I had over the last days, I think it's very important uh, that this uncertainty is fast removed because it's a uh, blockage to investments even if you had a big increase in FDIs. But, um, Minister, I have seen that um, uh, capex of Indian business is not at the desired levels. Uh, now you have here um, some of the heads of the big Indian companies. What would be your message to them? You see, as far as uh, 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 investment in India is concerned, uh, I am conscious of the fact that the private sector investment has been slow. And uh, it's been slow because uh, private sector was also conditioned by two factors. One was demand, along with the slowdown world over, which had also impacted the Indian economy. 
The other was a large number of Indian companies, and I think uh, Indian private sector has to seriously introspect, had overborrowed and overstretched itself. And therefore, with expanded capacities, they now have to utilize their existing capacities before they could uh, think in terms of investing more. Uh, 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 I'm conscious of that fact. And therefore, uh, for me to get into a self-critical exercise over this uh, and blame them for what happened in the past, I think will serve absolutely no purpose. And therefore, ordinarily the principle is that uh, when growth is to take place, private sector leads the government. But when you are uh, uh, emerging out of a slowdown mold, world over it's public investment which takes over. And fortunately for us, uh, uh, with the current global oil and commodity price regime, the public investment resources, uh, uh, additionality of those resources are available. And therefore we are making every attempt to make sure that on infrastructure and several other areas, uh, public investment increases. And I am glad that uh, over the last few months it's significantly increased. Not only from the government coffers itself, but I recently had last week a review meeting with the Indian pub public sector companies. And uh, a very large number of them have been sitting on piles and piles of cash. And uh, uh, we've asked each one of the 35 major public sector companies which were represented in that meeting, uh, which was sitting on uh, huge amounts of money to start expansion programs. So between the government and the public sector, there's a very large uh, 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 public investment plan which is picking up. And I think uh, along with this, with the liberalization in the FDI policies that we have done, uh, India has uh, attracted one of the largest FDIs anywhere in the world. So with public investment, public sector investment, uh, large FDI coming in, I think the investment cycle itself has revived. And therefore, in certain sectors after sectors, I can now see, for instance, take uh, some of our infrastructure programs like the highways. Private investment had absolutely come to an end because the, uh, those who build the highways, their projects had become completely non-bankable. Now, with a large amount of public investment thrown in, I have now seen over the last few months, uh, the private sector also has jumped in, in, in a big way. Uh, similarly, we are addressing issues of stress sectors. Steel is a stress sector uh, because of uh, the, uh, the surge of Chinese uh, uh, steel which is coming in. So we've been, by taxation policy, we've been trying to address those issues. Uh, power is a stress sector. In the next uh, couple of days, we are likely to announce um, some major policy decision in that regard to get that sector out of stress. And once that happens, uh, I'm quite sure... Uh, uh, the, the, the private sector also uh, uh, will, uh, will start participating. You can't have a country which has a 7 to 8 percent growth and which aspires to get into the next le uh, league, uh, growth taking place without a private sector participation. Obviously, once it picks up, uh, the private sector uh, gets out of the current scenario and its uh, investment would be seen already in telecom, etc. We are seeing uh, in IT, in the startups, uh, we are seeing a big private sector investment already jumped in. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm quite sure this is likely to expand. Minister, this leads me to the next question. Um, see, I think you should be commended on um, the progress you made in uh, terms of the of macroeconomics, uh, the macroeconomic environment. Now, you referred to the infrastructure investment, and the figures I heard: 250 billion out of which I think um, uh, 120 um, billion uh, or 150 billion, I'm, I'm not, uh, you, you certainly have the right figures, uh, but a large proportion uh, will be financed by debt. Now, how do you see uh, the capability of the uh, government? Um, who, who, should, who should be responsible for the debt? Who is at the end? And this is one area, when we started off, uh, I think we started uh, with one clarity in mind that we need to build on the infrastructure. But we were unsure of domestic resources. And therefore, even last year we'd been um, uh, 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 calling conferences of international investors, etc., thinking in terms of our own um, investment fund with the government participation and so on, which is, which is still on track. And therefore, how the 
investment figures would uh, read itself uh, there was a, 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 a lurking suspicion it was more aspiration than actually money that you could see and fortunately since uh, we had uh, uh, the oil prices drop the commodity prices drop uh, and i think one of the uh, biggest unsung reforms of india in the last few months has been uh, uh, the subsidy reform mm -hmm. and therefore we started systematically by uh, subsidy as far as oil is concerned diesel is concerned uh, 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 the lpg is concerned we have now got pilot projects on food on we have a pilot project on um, uh, 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 kerosene which is on and the dbt and this itself has helped us to save a lot of money on that front it's a very significant amount added to it we used the drop in the the, uh, the oil prices uh, uh, passed on a lot of benefit to the consumers put the balance sheets of the oil companies back in shape and then created the infrastructure says so it got shared three ways and that itself has uh, helped us to put a lot more money so i have uh, a very large amount of money as far as the national highways is concerned in fact i am already running short on money as far as rural roads is concerned which comes from the budget itself and therefore i am thinking in terms of adding to it uh, as far as the railways is concerned probably the biggest unreformed sector we have a massive program now from uh, in railway infrastructure to railway stations being redone in 400 places uh, 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 the tenders are going to be out very uh, 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 shortly uh, i got the life insurance corporation to put uh, 150000 crores uh, as a 30 year loan on uh, a soft loan available to the railways itself for infrastructure investment and therefore we have used this regime in a big way to start funding the, uh, the, the these infrastructures added to this uh, uh, i think uh, our, our entire proposal to get uh, in addition to public private partnership uh, uh, the international funding into uh, uh, the investment fund itself which is also in the final stages of formation so that we can fund each one of these sectors where we find uh, short of uh, investment there are some infrastructures in which uh, uh, private sector is willing to come in ports for example i, I think there is no dearth of uh, uh, even domestic investment uh, along with joint ventures which is willing to come in the the big problem area for us at the moment as i speak to you uh, is the power sector and uh, uh, i think that's an infrastructure issue which we are going to be addressing uh, uh, literally in the next uh, couple of days if not in the next couple of hours itself uh, we've almost finalized our uh, approach in the direction because we have a system where we are generating more power than what india needs in fact there is the first time in history where we have surplus uh, resource the generation companies are in a difficulty because there are no takers for that power you have a grid which can take it to every part of the country but your last mile that is the state discoms have now become uh, extremely vulnerable because some of the states decided that not charging people adequately for the the user charges for the power was good politics now it wasn't good politics but it was certainly bad economics and those uh, discoms are not in a position to lift that power itself because of the financial condition so how, unless we are able to revive their health the whole chain itself is suffering and therefore this is one area of infrastructure which is essential uh, uh, which has remained unaddressed for the last so many years i think it is one which needs to be tackled immediately and our current focus is literally on this area and in as far as changes in the international monetary financial system which you would wish is there anything um of course we talk about imf global governance yes, yes, here we, we 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 do speak in terms of uh, the quota reforms as far as the imf is concerned and uh, the ball is now in the united states uh, uh, court itself and um, the uh, treasury secretary has been saying that uh, he is extremely keen uh, to give effect to it and he is trying his best within their domestic systems to have it cleared Thank you very much Minister Rai I think we are coming to an end